Welcome to How to Do Things with Words. I'm uh, this week giving you a little video on the two the two readings that we're looking at online, which are by um, uh, Fallis and Stoke. So these are two different articles offering two different accounts of line. Uh, this has become like an interesting debate in the last uh, little bit in the pragmatics literature about what is the nature of line. And it's our first opportunity to test the theory that we've been building over the first six weeks of this term on a phenomena that is of vital interest to us when it comes to people uh, using words to do things. So one of the things that we use words to, to do is to deceive one another. And the most uh, central way in which we do this is through lying. So the two articles you're looking at this week are on that. There's also a third article which focuses on a different but related phenomena called bullshit, bullshitting. And I will talk a little bit about that at the end. That's kind of a bonus theory that you can look at. This article is a, a really kind of a famous article within philosophy. The author of it, Harry Frankfurt, published it as a book um, a few years ago, uh, sorry, which was um, uh, well received. He was actually on The Daily Show to promote the book when it came out. Um, back when John Stewart was hosting. But uh, anyway, the, these two readings for today are really looking at the way in which we can use language to deceive others. And as I mentioned before, again, this, um, the, these readings and the readings we're gonna be looking at the, in the next few weeks really involve applications of the theory that we developed over the first six weeks of this term. So um, the handout for this begins with a kind of recap of what that picture of pragmatics that we've developed is. And I wanna to start today just by reading you that, um, essentially that recap of what that theory is. Um, this occurs too on the handout that you have to support these two readings, but I think it sort of brings together the different uh, facets of what we've been doing over the first part of this term, which you've been studying um, and putting together over this last week in your own um, exercises that you've produced. I think this, this really kind of captures the key ideas there. So um, I'll just read this and you can look at it again uh, on the handout yourself as you um, work on the things this week. But here's the basic point. In the first six weeks of this class, we have acquired a picture of pragmatics according to which people do things with the words they speak and write, right? Thus the name of this class, how to do things with words. So for example, people bring new facts uh, into existence. Now that of there is errant, so ignore that. They bring new facts into existence. For example, they make it so that this person, this person who I, for example, as a judge, we might imagine, have, have just pronounced guilt on, I make it in that case so that that person is now a criminal, right? Uh, if I'm an adjudicator of, uh, you know, uh, land disputes, I might make it the case so that some new property line or that some property line now lays here instead of there, right? I might do that by uttering some words, by saying here's where the property line lays in the appropriate conditions, right? Um, I may make it additionally um, so that two people are married, so that someone is bound by a new obligation, right? And so on. So these are things that I might do uh, by means of words. But another thing that people do uh, with words is to communicate, right? So they intend to affect their audience with the things they say. And when communication is successful, um, when communication is successful, they affect their audience in the ways that they intend because their audience recognizes that this is how they intend to affect them. Right, so here we're capturing kind of the Gricean theory of meaning that we discussed, Gricean theory of communication. Now it's important to note here, and maybe this is something that I've glossed over a little bit earlier in the class, and I wanna make clear that people mean things by the things they say, whether they affect their audience in the way they intend or not, simply because they intend to affect an audience, right? So you can main, mean something according to Grice, even if no one hears or understands you, right? Um, and that seems obvious to us, right? Someone can mean something, even if they're not, you know, people aren't responding to it in the appropriate way. But if people speak your language, if they understand the words you say and are paying attention, then um, 
then uh, then um, you will have a chance for com successful communication. And successful communication here need not be limited merely to understanding what is said, right? And so in our class, we spent a lot of time talking about the ways in which successful communication can go beyond simply grasping what is said. Often we understand much more of what we mean to communicate to one another than merely what we say to one another. We understand, for instance, um, what is merely implied by what is said. In instances of successful communication involving conversation, uh, conversational implicature, hearers infer what speakers imply by what they say. And these inferences are ground in a shared tacit knowledge of the rules of conversation and the shared and mutually recognized acceptance uh, beyond all conversational or, or, or uh, among all conversational participants of a set of presuppositions that are assumed to be in force in the context of conversation. That is the common ground for a set of conversational participants, right? So we're able to communicate things with one another, we're able to communicate what is said, but we're also able to communicate things that are implied by what is said. And we're able to do that because we share this common ground of information that we can rely on in, do, in uh, inferring what one another mean when they speak. Now, there are of course disagreements between people who accept this general picture of communication. So theorists might be bound to this general picture but disagree against about some of the finer points. We've talked about some of these disagreements for example, there are numerous and vigorous debates over the degree to which pragmatics, understood here as person-level inference from context, intrudes upon and shapes the meaning of what is said. But this general picture of communication will be presupposed by the authors we read in the second part of this course. Even if they disagree on some of these finer points about how what is said is calculated, or how the primary propositional content is calculated, they still accept all of the general framework that I've laid out here. Um, these authors, the authors that we're going to read in the weeks to come, offer accounts of complex pragmatic phenomena, line, slurs, acts of silencing speakers, which will be a new kind of idea to you, and figurative language that build off of this general picture of pragmatics that you now have under your belt. Okay, so that's essentially a picture of what we have done in the first six weeks of these term, this term. And now we're turning to applying this to specific topics. This week, we're applying this hard fought theory of pragmatics to lying and as a secondary matter to bullshit. So you should read the Phallus article first, what is lying, then Stoke is lying and asserting. And then if you have time and want to learn more about these topics, I highly suggest Frankfurt's article on bullshit, which is an optional reading uh, tied um, to uh, this week's class. And I'll say a little bit more about that reading as we move forward.